please welcome Marcus Child. And Marcus will be joined by John Blakey for our Q&A afterwards. Marcus, thank you. Thank you very much and good afternoon everybody. I'm uh, broadcasting from uh, Bybury in the Cotswolds. I've been locked down for far too long and uh, probably a little bit uh, uh, cabin fever has set in, let's say that. But uh, while I'm talking to you this afternoon, I want to just cover how uh, the history of change happens. Uh, it, there tends to be that pattern over my shoulder. An order, it's then thrown into disarray and then there's a reordering of things for a time until uh, there's more disorder. But I think there's something ever so interesting about looking at this time that we're going through. Whether it's a uh, climate change where we had an order and it got thrown into disarray with the uh, uh, understanding about how we're treating the climate, our planet, plastics, etc. There's an argument about fossil fuel versus electricity. And before we know it, there's conflict, ambiguity, ownership, loss, selfishness protection, genuine keenness to make change happen, and then a reordering of things. Black Lives Matter caused something similar. Things thrown into chaos, into disorder, into question. And then in the future, we've, we'll find a new order. People will own the new order. But what it means really is COVID the same. We go through this pattern. In the disorder, some people come out better than others. Some people make more constructive use of time. Some people find new keys, new innovations than others. And it depends on the kind of state we keep ourselves in during the disorder. I don't suppose every politician is a self-serving egotist who uh, wants to make their selfish order come true. Some of them must be decent with proper plans and, uh, and neat ideas, but none of them lack haters. So there's a sense in which as soon as you come up with an idea which is going to be useful in the reordering, as worthy as it might be, as properly interested and authentic as it might be, you'll always face challenge. Therefore, we need the big R word in here when we're going through chaos. That word that's the buzzword all over the place, resilience. And I'm just trying to unpick where resilience comes from. Because if we can keep ourselves in a state of grace and kindness and decency, cool-headedness, calmness, then uh, we'll be in better place to handle ourselves well in the disorder and own some of the stuff in the real room. So 2020 has been a chance to uh, reset ourselves, reset our relationship with our families, our relationship with time, with money, with our customers, the business we do. And the word crisis that we hear so much comes from a Greek word uh, spelt with a K. And its etymology is, it's a time when we're invited, challenged, to make a proper decision and uh, to reevaluate things and for the good. I didn't think I could mention crisis without uh, mentioning China somewhere along this uh, spectrum of conversation. But in Cantonese, if a Chinese Cantonese reader reads these two characters, they're reading the word crisis. If I see six letters of crisis, it evokes for me you know, uh, the meaning of that word. But for a Cantonese reader, the first character means chaos or danger, imminent. And the second character, well, it's debatable. Some people say it means opportunity. Other people say that's too positive a reading, but it means turning point. But I love the notion of looking at a crisis and seeing straight away the heat, the pressure, but also the opportunity. And we've been invited to do this all the way through. Arthur Ashe, the uh, tennis player put it rather well. He said, in the end, in any situation, all you can do is control the controllables. And isn't that really the answer? Start where, this is Captain Tom, isn't it? Who became Colonel Tom. Start where you are, in my garden. Use what you have, a Zimmer frame. Do what you can. I'll try a hundred laps. But there's something else here. William Blake, the poet, put it rather well. See, I think there's something about momentum. I think happiness is about momentum. It's not really about arrival, but it's about us moving towards something that we cherish the notion of. And sometimes people get stuck. If you've ever met somebody who's completely, well, let's say cynical and sarcastic as soon as we start, as soon as uh, you offer an idea, propose something which uh, you think is constructive, as soon as somebody knocks it down and gets into that place. See, I think we meet people who just get in a pattern. 
And they know the type I mean, and it becomes rather predictable. They get validation from criticising and knocking. And uh, I don't mean that, don't think that person gets home on a Friday evening and says to their partner, ha ha, honey, I'm home. I've been a cynical bastard all week, but now it's the weekend. I'll be all kind and polite to you and the children and then go back to being a tosser again on Monday morning. That's not how it works. We get into patterns and rhythms and routines psychologically. And there's something ever so important about making sure we don't get stuck. And I think there's something to celebrate, therefore, when we go into a time of chaos and challenge, because it stirs the water up and gives us all a question or two to answer. So I think we can celebrate these things. And actually, uh, maybe that's a, a proper way of knowing this. But in the end, our knowledge is often passive. And we really don't understand something until we've tried and used it. I don't think we think our way out of a crisis or strategize our way. It's about action. And in the action, the true learning comes. So I don't like to drop names, as I said to the Queen the other day, but I did uh, have a conversation with Manchester United, or a few actually, when they, were, when they won the Champions League and in the 1990s. And so Alex Ferguson used to say, that was the family motto in his home in Glasgow. You always have to know that it's gonna be sweeter after the difficulty. And he'd make the team train particularly hard and uh, an extra long. And then when they were exhausted, they'd have to do it again. And then when they were really complaining, set up for free kicks now. Why? Because the time you'll need a free kick to go in is not when you're fresh, it's when you're absolutely spent. And there's the work. It will taste sweeter after difficulty. So I think there's something ever so important about how we might bear some of these things in mind, because it's not masochistic to say that when we really start to go through something challenging, we've got to know there will be benefits and that we will be stronger afterwards. And somebody is going to do it anyhow. So I've been thinking over lockdown about five qualities which uh, I'd like to expand upon at a later date. But uh, the five things we need from our leaders if we're going to get through the times of disorder. And the first one, see I've been locked down too long, I'm writing Superman logos on flip charts. But the first one I want to say is, uh, is how we manage our state. How we keep ourselves in a state of composure and kindness and grace and cool headedness so that we can make good decisions. I think when you feel bad, you make bad decisions. When you feel good, you make better ones. So our state really matters, and that's our first priority. And I think there's a secret. How do we do that? You know, stepping into each room we step into, not casually, and all, but to step into a room and just to catch ourselves for a moment. What's the best outcome? How can I be best for the people in this room? What's the intention I take into this room that can serve them? And I let most myself align myself with that before and get properly centered before I go in there and, uh, and give all I can. Rather than just drifting into one place undeliberately, I think managing our state's a really key thing. I think uh, actually that thought comes from Elvis. Elvis Presley in the latter years of his life when he was so overweight, sweating with every stride, and his life in tatters, Priscilla's gone and he's taking drugs. It's the end game for him. He, even Elvis would ask his entourage, could you park my trailer? a hundred yards away from the entrance of the theatre that I'm going to be stepping into to do this concert. And because he reckoned he could get his life together uh, in a hundred strides and make that deliberate walk, walk himself into a place of resourcefulness. So they burst. But the thing is, as he burst onto the stage, he said what he'd be thinking about was the people in the room and how far they travelled and what they wanted from this celebratory phenomenal night. And uh, he said, once I got that in mind, I disappeared. The ego, the self-consciousness goes. I think there's something about one of the powerful ways of managing our state is to think of others and to think about what they need. That's not meant to be some kind of big selfless message, but I think it's ever so important. I did a talk to Brain Tumor UK uh, a few years ago. 60 people with a brain tumor, well, 60 people came to the room. 30 of them, 30 of them had a tumor, which would see them pass within uh, three months. And the other 30 were holding the hands of somebody they loved and they didn't know how I was going to say goodbye to them. And I was asked by a gentleman called David if I would uh, approach this group really positively. He said, Marcus, when you walk into the room, you're going to see a lot of head bandages and people rolling and some tears. But don't be put off by it. It's not a pity party and they don't want your sympathy. What we want from you is ideas about how you can sustain positivity right to the end because they're, they come because they're hopeful and they think that they can finish this thing well. And so uh, don't you be downbeat. Cheery is the name of it. So I turned up there and I've been briefed by David several times, a very kind man, coordinator of the Southeast 
at Brain Tumor UK. And when I met him, he was in a fine suit, shaking hands with people, making sure they had a place to sit and got tea and coffee and being absolutely cheer on legs. And then he looked at me and I guess he noticed the look on my face. He said, oh, Marcus, now, I didn't tell you that I am ever so sorry. I've got this too. And there he was with a huge scar across his forehead. He said, uh, I'll be gone in a fortnight. But, uh, do you know, this has been keeping me together. This is keeping me, you know, I've been looking forward to this event so much. And uh, it's going to be a fantastic event. So uh, thank you ever so much for coming. And uh, let's get started. And I thought, wow, maybe there is something in that. Maybe that is the skill or the, uh, the best way of making sure we're good. Making sure we're focusing on other people, not ourselves. But uh, a couple of other things to say. I think it's ever so important for us to be positive. Be really upbeat, bright-sided. We know that the internet exhorts us to be positive all the time. But uh, what I really mean by here, here is uh, something about deep, deep rational optimism. Really, it's Stockdale paradox. If you ever came across that in stuck in psychology, that's uh, you know Admiral Jim Stockdale sent to Vietnam in the Hanoi Hilton for eight years between 1975 and 63. And uh, he suffers torture, 20 proper bouts of torture. And he sees it as his duty to help the men under his command as the senior officer to manage to withstand torture and not give away the key secrets that the Viet Cong wanted. And uh, so he suffered sustained, enduring torture and uh, taught the men how to just give away some secrets that uh, we can dispose of, but keep the crown jewels. And effectively, it was a successful mission. Anyhow, when he was released, he was asked the question, how did you survive? And he didn't know how to answer it. The psychologist is posing the question and he's uh, dumbfounded. Well, uh, was it because you're optimistic? He said, uh, no, the optimist died. The optimist, they said things like, hope for Christmas, wait for Christmas, believe in Christmas. And when Christmas came and went, well, uh, believe in Easter. Picture being with your family at Easter. They're restless by then. He said, they died of a broken heart. Here's the paradox. He said the people who really survive have a deep, enduring belief that they will prevail. Right in your system, a deep faith. We have to believe that we're going to make it and uh, it will be sweeter after difficulty. It's just that we have to act as though it's very unlikely. So you have to embrace the gritty hardship of the situation you're in and win by playing the game of inches. And we can't duck it. You can't say like Trump did, COVID's going to go away just to bury your head in the sand. It's not going to. The only way we're going to make it is if we believe we'll prevail, but at the same time behave as though it's really unlikely and get working hard, grafting into finding ways of making vaccines work, etc. But uh, there it is. It's the Premier League manager saying, we're not talking about winning the Premier League. We're playing one game at a time. It's Muhammad Ali saying, think like a winner, believe deep down, but uh, act like a contender. I suppose it's that really where I live, that we will prevail. We will have delicious moments of celebration again. It is going to come. It's just that you have to act with the bulldog dissemination spirit of the moment, which uh, is properly embracing the grit of the situation. That's what I really mean. But I also mean that you have to set the ambition really strong. You have to have an ambition, a proper intention. And I think entrepreneurs just find ambition and goals and destinations and new places to, to aim for faster than others. And uh, that's what sets them apart, actually. Now, proper leaders who just uh, see the chance, see the opportunity and don't hang about, start planning and getting stuck in. But I don't mean that ambition is a selfish thing. I don't think it's an ego trip. It comes from a medieval word um, which was about nobility walking their ambit. As a noble, your duty is to make sure that once a year you walk the extremity of the territory that you are st steward over and make sure that the peasants are happy. Sit down, metaphorically have a cup of tea with them and find out if they're okay. See what you can do for them. Look after them. Because by the way, if you don't look after them, then your territory is not going to grow very far because eventually there'll be disorder and pitchforks, etc. But I think if we take that as it's really intended, the only way to be successful is to make sure other people are successful. Deep down, the best way to be a success is to help others be successful. And uh, there's a spirit in that which I really admire. Also, I love the thought that uh, we need belief, confidence. But uh, that comes from a Latin word, confidere, which literally means total trust. So if you've got total trust in yourself, you're self-confident. But this is about us bringing other people with us and having confidence in them, believing they can be furloughed, they can work from home and they can make it. 
In the end, we have to do what Hemingway said. The best way to find out if you can trust somebody is to trust them. Throw the kitchen, I, I'm fed up with hearing leaders of businesses saying, we've taken on a new marketing director, we've taken on a new R&D director, and say, well, how are they getting on? Well, the jury's out. What do you mean the jury's out? You've taken them on, haven't you? The job is to absolutely massively support them, throw everything behind them, completely support them, totally trust them, and if they break your trust, oh well, then you found out. But uh, people fly much better if you really are behind and uh, beneath and lifting. So, and the last word, it's been the word of COVID for me actually. There's so many times, when I win awards, which sometimes happen when they haven't got anyone else to give them to, they say to me, they say things like, this is Marcus Child, the Tigger of the uh, Chief Executive Community here. Or, uh, this man's got Duracell batteries. We felt energised by his presentation. I've been doing stuff all through lockdown, of which uh, I've been offering new ideas. I read a lot. I got a distinction from Cambridge. I consider myself to be an academic. And I say all these things and uh, try and make them in really simple, crisp terms. But anyway, I give all the stuff and they say, yeah, thank you very much, Marcus. Energising. I said, what about the idea there? What about that concept, that model? Yeah, energising. That's all they say. And I'm looking forward to your feedback, by the way. But energising is what they say. I think, well, uh, how about that? But uh, I think actually it's a massive word. I think it's worth its weight in gold. I, uh, I just think there's something massive about the zest for life and the enthusiasm for an idea that somebody might have and how infectious and energising, boosting, nourishing that can be for others. And I don't think this is about us necessarily being extra with our energy, but uh, it's maybe a slow burn, deep determined energy which uh, pulls us through and enables us to prevail. But a last thought, because I know times are pressing. Um, I read a book years ago called The New Alchemists by Charles Handy. And Charles Handy, it's a very small, very small contact group, this. Charles Handy lives within the M25 around London, and uh, he's rather elderly at this stage. So he decides he's just going to study entrepreneurs who live within the M25. But he said, but he said that uh, it was a moment, it was an epoch in the 90s where the zeitgeist of entrepreneurial behaviour was absolutely thriving. So this book concentrates on people like, they were all in the same place at the same time. Remember this? Oswald Boateng, the tailor, Richard Branson, Dee Dawson, who set up the, uh, the first anorexic clinic, Terence Conran was there, Charles Dunstan, Rose Fenton and Lucy Neal, who uh, ran the International Festival Theatre. Um, there's a lovely one, uh, D um, D Jane Chewson, who started Comic Relief, and there's Julian Richer and Tim Waterstone, and just an astonishing star-studded cast. But uh, he wants to know what have these people got in common? And one of the things he finds they've got in common is that uh, there he describes them as they see themselves as fleas on elephants. We call these people disruptors these days. But in the 90s, he said a lot of them have got a, an elder, elder sibling or they're a middle sibling at least, and they've got this need to prove themselves. It's a bit like imposter syndrome. People have that, don't they? I think it's okay to have it, to part, honestly, because it's stopped there again. If you ever took the job and you feel like you're an imposter, well, you didn't take the job because you didn't think you could do it. Deep down, deep down, you believed you could. But some days you wake up thinking, I'm not sure I'm good enough. And that to me is hunger and thirst and not complacency. And that gets us through. I think it's fine, actually. It's, uh, it's the two in balance again. Don't overdo the, uh, you know, the balance in terms of worrying too much, but I think uh, there's a healthy need, the pleasure of pressure, as I might want to call it. But the second thing is, uh, he calls it doggedness. He says, passion generates energy and the capacity for hard work, just as well because hard work, determination and tenacity are all needed. Jane Chewson said, don't make it sound easy, it isn't. Nevertheless, when it's your own creation, when it's your own ambition and other people want to buy into it, and feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves, then it hardly seems like work. A Benedictine monk has asked the question, what's the antidote to exhaustion? And his answer, not necessarily rest. The antidote to exhaustion is wholeheartedness, doing something with the whole of your heart. When you've thrown that in, then uh, everything else will look after itself. So I wonder whether uh, that might be just a, an inkling in terms of what we might want to focus on in terms of enabling ourselves to get through disorder in the future and more of the stuff. Thank you ever so much. Thank you, Marcus. Fantastic. Thank you for an incredibly energising <laughs> talk. <laughs> now, I want to just take you back, uh, Marcus, because you said you said sometimes I have won an award or two. Um, 
Now, I want you to share with this audience, I know you're a humble man, but I want you to share with this audience, how often have you won the Speaker of the Year Award at Vistage, which is one of the world's, the world's largest CEO membership organization? How often have you won that award? And when did you first win it? Uh, I first won it in 2001. Uh, and uh, I won it this year, and I've won it five times. Incredible. I know the quality of the speakers in that that that, that group. And if you talk about energy, to, to, to sustain that level of energy engagement over that period of time, Marcus, I think is phenomenal. So thank you for, for sharing, again, your, your energy with us today. I, I just want to ask you a, a, a few little questions on what you've um, you talked about today and shared with us. Just go back to the beginning. You talked about order disorder and reorder um and i want i want to ask you a sort of question on that is that sounds quite linear you know we've got order then we've got disorder then we've got reorder there are, there are some people now saying that actually we're living in this volatile ambiguous uncertain world uh you know where we're continually going to be in this washing machine of of disorder um you know endlessly i, I just want to understand your your take on that what's what's your view on that that's a really good question because, of course, this is just uh, an illusion. Uh, I'm really talking about illusion. That it's just that I think there's something important about making that. Let's say there are some periods which are more chaotic than other times, other epochs, where we're going through this as an as a as a world. This is pandemic. Now, of course, there's always going to be flux and change, but uh, there are periods of intensity, and some people don't make it through the periods of intensity or give up or break or do something else and so it's an illusion to say those things happen although i think in a macro sense that does happen and by the way in a life in a person's life we also have similar there are times when you feel like you know you're on top of things and things are going nicely and then a partner gets ill or dies or something serious happens to us and then eventually we come out of it again but i think it's worth looking for macro patterns in what seems like a total chaos otherwise we can just argue we're always in chaos it's always impossible how we're going to keep ourselves together so uh, i think it's it's hard to endure anything even a talk from me unless you can see a finish line and you can see a kind of ha huh, we're going to take a break and then go again people talk this about this as a strategic recovery if you like but uh, i think if you see it like that then uh, we can give ourselves rests from time to time yeah Great, thank you. Um, you talked about crisis, uh, and I think the definition of crisis uh, about an uh, it's an indication that an important decision needs to be made. Um, so, just ask you a, a personal question. You know, over the last sort of ten months, um, as you've gone through this macro crisis that we've all gone through, uh, could you give us an example of an important decision that that you've made uh, in in the middle of this uh, crisis? We didn't prepare that. Prepare these questions. No. <laughs> didn't prepare this one. <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, but, you know, it's interesting. All those years of working, uh, you know, like I've done. Do you know the last? Just being honest, uh, the last three years, the average mileage on my car has been fifty-five thousand miles. So that's a, uh, and um, it's one hundred and eighty-five nights away from home. And I think you can justify anything to yourself if you want to. And I've found a way of justifying to myself that kind of mileage and that kind of number of nights away. I am happily, you know, in a happy relationship. You might say that's because we spend so many nights away. But, uh, I, you know, uh, and so, so Carl and I have made a deal, actually, that uh, when we go back to any kind of, you know, old pattern, then uh, 20,000 miles and then the keys in the drawer, not doing any more than that. And uh, so that's a proper decision. Hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you. And I'm, I'm sure there's lots of people listening into this who do, who, who will have been doing lots of air miles, or lots of car miles. And, and, and for sure, I'm sure a lot of us are thinking, hang on a minute, what, what do we want to consciously choose now as our, as our sort of optimum um, in, in, as we come out of this pandemic? So I yeah. think that's a, yeah, a, a sure. great, a very practical sure. example. John, I did a talk this morning and it was in Ireland and uh, the people were gathered all in the same room, but uh, I was the only one not there. Uh, and I think it went very well. It was, you know, I got them to do work and break out and stuff like that. I think it was a success. But it's a completely different pattern. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, and uh, your five superpowers, space, um, the one, the first one that you talked about, managing our state. Um, now, one of the things I've noticed in the crisis and, and a lot of the leaders that I'm working with, uh, I've noticed it with them and they've, and they've shared this with me, 
And it's on this subject of mojo that, you know, people have woken up, ambitious, positive, confident people have woken up in the middle of this pandemic and they have realized they have completely lost their mojo, flat as a pancake. And, and, and I've said to them, you know, I'm noticing that you're not alone. It, it happens. I'd be interested in your view on if you fall out of that state that you want to be in, how do you get back? How do you get back as quickly as possible? Because I think we all fall off the horse. But how do we get back on the horse as quickly as possible? Right. Well, there are there are five fibres to resilience. And if you imagine a cable interwoven five fibres, then uh, those five things are things that we can control and have an impact on. And, uh, and I think we can set goals and drive ourselves in those five ways which uh, cause instant pickups. Now, this does sound like a teaser. It is. That's the stuff of the masterclass that I'm going to be talking about. But how do you get those five fibres? To really work for you and the great thing about it is if you look at resilience as being made up of five things you work on just one thing and it can have an ameliorating enhancing effect on the others um what which is one small thing that uh, we did do in lockdown family all together three kids in their 20s Karen and i in this house and we're locked down we've got some land and it's lovely but uh well, i said to them it's a bit like shackleton crossing the, the antarctica he said, we're going to take the cameras despite the weight of the camera and the march. Why? Because when we get out of here, we'll be able to show people photographs of what we went through. And it, of course, carrying the camera presupposes success. And I said to the family, when we go into lockdown here now, this is going to be an epoch like we've never had. Let's make a photo diary. And uh, so let's, let's photograph the, the learnings, the firsts, the things we'd like to do more of afterwards. And, you know, I think that really raised the whole game and the whole tone of the thing. Because when you realise that you're making something which is for the future, it's curious how that changes things. But there, yeah. are, there are some straightforward tips and techniques which are, I'm going to share like crazy uh, in that masterclass. Great. Thank you. And, and fi final question, Marcus, for you. Um, we had um, another speaker that we probably both know well uh, earlier today, Dave Thomas, talking about virtual speaking and how to master the virtual arena. Uh, you, you've been Speaker of the Year, um, you know, many, many times. You've, uh, I'm sure, done more virtual speaking in the last 10 months than you've done in the last sort of 20 years. Uh, what, what's, what's your learning about speaking in a, in a virtual environment? What are you doing differently or the same? Have you got any tips for us? Because as I say, you're, you're at the top of this game and it, it's always great to just hear what you are still learning about this virtual speaking space. Right, well, uh, okay, um, I prepare myself properly, I mean really properly. Uh, I decided at the beginning I was going to share the screen a lot. I was sharing the screen and uh, realised that's rather passive, people are watching TV. So I went back to flip charts and thought if I make flip charts like this, it's going to be animated and exciting for me. And, uh, and I've got them, so that's one thing which I think uh, changes the whole style of the thing actually. Um, I dress properly for this, I've got proper shoes on and I'm wearing trousers and everything. You know, uh, but then there is that thing of you know, taking a walk up the garden and then uh, walking into the house and then being ready. Uh, so those sorts of personal preparation things are nice. I also love the idea actually that uh, I can, it's different from making, if I can show you my, uh, my, my room here where I'm working, it's a bit, uh, it's really chaotic okay, so be prepared for chaos, but uh, you know I've got all this stuff all over the desk and I sort of go where I want to go really. And, uh, and look at all those crib sheet notes there sort of thing, stuff that I might want to say or not say. And uh, I love the idea of you know, it's all there and, uh, and I'll go where the energy feels best. So it feels spontaneous. So it doesn't feel like I'm doing the one that I did last time. And that's really healthy. Yeah, great. Well, thanks. Thank you again. And thank you for uh, you talked about uh, in your talk about um, helping others. You know, that, that, that that's often a, a, also a way to to boost our resilience. And uh, you, I'm sure you, you, you've helped many people this afternoon with that talk, just giving them that. That energy give them those tips and uh, I, I wholeheartedly recommend people to uh, sign up for your your master class because having had you as a speaker to my uh, trusted executive groups over the years yeah you're you're right up there and, and people uh, honestly you're, you're missing a treat if you don't uh, if you don't sign up for that one so uh, thank you again Marcus on behalf of uh, hospitality tomorrow that's my pleasure and privilege thank you ever so much John